So now apart from uh, gait pattern, um, three of the uh, movement goals that are, are, are movement um, concepts which I think are uh, of um, ultimate importance uh, for patients postoperatively uh, are the following. Uh, I want all my patients by the six week mark to achieve a full extension of their leg. We'll demonstrate that in a moment. Full flexion of their operated uh, knee. And then lastly, normal quad activation uh, of that of the operative leg. Uh, of those three uh, components, the most important uh, to obtain first, in my eyes, is the full extension. Uh, because the, the full extension allows the patient to walk with the normal gait mechanics, which then uh, minimizes the chance of them developing other problems such as anterior knee pain on the operating side, contralateral hip pain, or low back pain. Um, so um, the extension is, is the most important in, in my mind. And so oftentimes uh, uh, patients will come see patients and they'll tell me, well, they can get their leg flat so they have full extension. However, if you look at my non-operative leg, when I actively contract the quadricep muscle, you'll see that my heel comes up because most people have a small amount of uh, hyperextension built into the opposite, or built into uh, their uh, knee joint. And so, uh, when I say full extension, I want people to have full extension symmetrical to the non-operate side on uh, their operated leg. And I want them to develop that uh, because that, if they have that on both sides, they will then walk with a symmetrical gait. And that's what we're trying to restore for people, a symmetrical gait pattern. So um, full extension does not necessarily mean flat. When I say full extension to my patients, I mean full symmetrical extension to the non-operated leg. So if your heel comes up um, an inch and a half on the non-operated leg, then on the operated leg, I would like that heel to come up to the same amount. Okay, so that's extension. Um, when we talk about full flexion, again, the same thing applies. So whatever you have on the non-operated side is what I'd like you to work towards achieving on the operated side. Now, clearly you're not gonna be able to do that right away, but that's the goal. And there's a number of ways that we assess that. Um, most typically people will lay down and I'll have them bring their operative leg as close to uh, their buttock as possible. I'll hold that one there, and then I'll bring the uh, operated leg as close to that as possible. Now, obviously for myself, this being the first day after surgery, I have a little bit of limitation, but that's one of the ways in which, the, uh, in which I will assess this. Another way in which I'll assess this is I'll get the patient to lay, pr lay uh, prone and I'll get them to bend their op or non-operative leg up and I'll measure their heel to buttock distance and then I'll get them to bring their operated leg up and I will do the same and I will compare to see if the heel to buttock distance is symmetrical on each side or whether it is asymmetrical. And if it is not the same, then that tells me that they need additional work on flexion. Lastly, the thing that I um, talk to patients about postoperatively is quad activation. And so we want to make sure that um, after people have surgery that they are able to activate the quad muscles so that they can walk properly and so they, they control themselves after surgery. Patients often say that they feel like their leg is going to buckle or their leg is going to give way and typically the um, reason for this is because they do not have quad activation afterwards. So um, one of the things that's important is that we want to make sure that we are able to activate the quad and when I say the quad, I mean all of the quad, all four muscle bellies, and in particular, the VMO, or the vastus medialis obliquus, is the one that we need to really make sure that we um, activate. And so, when, we, um, when I'm assessing quad activation, I'll act, I will ask the patient to um, contract the quad mechanism, and, or quad muscle, and I will check to make sure that all of the muscle bellies are firing. So on my non-operative leg, if I were to squeeze the quadricep, you can see 
as I do that, there's some more definition in the bellies of the quadricep muscles. You can only see the top three because the, the um, uh, one of the muscle bellies is underneath the uh, um, more superficial layers. Um, however, you can see the definition of the individual muscle bellies and in particular the VMO and you can see that and touch that and know that it is firing. So post-operatively I often find that people have very poor quadricep function on the operative leg uh, and so you need to spend time firing that muscle um, to make sure that you restore the function of that muscle. And so you need to squeeze the quad, you need to be able to touch each of the muscle bellies and know that they are firm and that they are firing. So this is non-active quad, non-contracted, non and here's the contracted quad and you can see the difference. So we need to make sure that we work on that right from the start. The longer that you allow that muscle to remain dormant and non-active, the longer you are going to have problems with your gait and, the, and problems with the stability of your knee because the stability of your knee is made up of both static and dynamic factors. The main dynamic factor is the muscles around the knee and in particular the quadricep. If you do not have good control of the quadricep, you're not going to walk properly, you're not going to have good stability of your knee, you're not going to be able to do stairs or anything like that. So. Um, that is another important concept. So to reiterate, the three things that I think are important are full, full extension, full flexion, and full active quad activation. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, extension exercises and I always come back to that first because as I said I think that extension, achieving full extension is the, um, uh, uh, the ultimate importance in terms of, of making sure that our rehab goes uh, smoothly. So one of the first things that I'll do with patients uh, is uh, I'll have them lay in a, uh, on the examination table in a prone manner and I'll usually get them to hang their legs off of the table in this manner. And usually I'll stand at the end of the table and I'll measure or I will assess their heel heights. And what I'm looking for is to see that both heels are at the same height if looking from the end of the table. And most typically what I'll see is something like this where the operative leg is at a higher heel height. And this will tell me that they do not have full extension. So we will, uh, or I will demonstrate some exercises to help work on that extension. Um, and and uh, so that they can obtain a symmetrical heel height pattern. And when looking at the heel height, it's important to make sure that they are laying flat, to make sure that the buttocks are not elevated, but the buttocks are flat, and you are assessing with the knees off the table, okay? Now, when we are, um, the exercise that I'm gonna demonstrate, um, there are a few things to keep in mind uh, for these or any of the exercises that I'm going to show. So all of these exercises right now are stretching type of exercises and generally in order to get any um, value out of the, the stretch we need to make sure that we are holding the stretch for an adequate amount of time and we need to make sure that we are doing so with an adequate amount of intensity. If you're not holding them long enough or you're not holding them firmly enough you're not going to get any use or any value out of them. So, um, generally speaking, when we are doing these stretches, I always advise people to hold each stretch for a minimum of 60 seconds um, and a maximum of 120 seconds for each stretch. One to two minutes for each stretch. Um, and I also uh, um, advise them to work outside of their zone of comfort. And what I mean by this, that is this. If you were to consider pain on a 0 to 10 level, where 0 is no pain at all and 10 is the worst pain imaginable, requiring you to go to the hospital, I want people to generally hold their stretches anywhere from 6, 7 or 8 out of 10. And I want them to be able to hold that for the full 60 to 120 seconds. When they are doing the stretch, they should have to feel some discomfort but be able to master that by controlling their breathing and relaxing through the stretch. They shouldn't really be able to have a conversation with you. It should be um, intense enough that they have to concentrate on what they're doing for the full 60 seconds. 
Uh, but that's the level of discomfort that generally people need to um, experience to get some value from the stretch, okay? So, as I said, 60 to 120 seconds at an intensity level of about six, seven, or eight, okay? And usually for each stretch, I want people to do these stretches two or three times. So they would hold it for 60 seconds, relax for a little bit, come back, do it again, relax for a little bit, do it one last time. And I usually advise them to do it once in the morning and do it in the uh, afternoon. But since there are several stretching exercises, they end up spending, um, you know, 15 minutes or so in the morning, 15 uh, or so minutes in the evening. Okay, so the first stretch that we're going to do is what we call a prone stretch with the feet hanging. And I'm going to demonstrate two ways to do this uh, because I have my patients do this in two different ways depending on whether or not I've done an ACL reconstruction. So if I've just done a knee arthroscopy with no ACL reconstruction, or if I am not concerned about the integrity of the ACL, I will have the patient lay on the examination table or their uh, whatever surface they're going to use for the stretch at home in this manner with their knees at the end of the table but off the table. And I will get them to perform a stretch like this. So I'll advise them to make sure that they lay flat with their stomach flat, their buttocks low, and their upper body flat against the table. Then I will usually tell them to take their non-operative leg and cross over the operative leg. And then I'll tell them to push down firmly with the non-operative leg to stretch the operative leg in this way. Okay, and then I ask them to hold that for 60 seconds and they have to press with a fair level of pressure to make sure that they can achieve that uh, intensity of six seven or eight out of ten and they have to hold that okay and so then they'll do that and when they do that they have to make sure that again they're not elevating their buttocks off the table and they're not rolling to one side or the other or that the legs are not spread apart Okay, you want, or you want to make sure that the knees are one beside the other and you just cross the ankles and press down. Okay, so I'll have them perform the stretch in that manner at the start. However, after they've been doing this for, for several days, most people will find that they are able to do this comfortably and they're able to hold it for 60 seconds with no difficulty. Once they get to that level, I will then have them take up the the stretch to the next level which is where I will instead of having them cross at the ankles I'll have them take their toe of the non-operative side and press down on the heel of the operative side to get an even deeper stretch through the posterior capsule and the posterior structures of the knee. Everything else about the stretch remains the same, the time and intensity remain the same, the body position remains the same. All we've done now is increase the intensity of the stretch by um, using the toes and thereby increasing the distance rather than using the ankle. So this is the way that I would have my patients perform this stretch for um, a leg in which I had only performed an arthroscopy. Um, if they have a uh, knee in which I've performed an ACL reconstruction or if I am concerned about the integrity of the ACL I would not have them do this in this manner. In that case I would have them slide up and only hang their feet off the table and then I would also have them place either a rolled up towel or some sort of object underneath the thigh just above the knee on the operative side to gain a little bit of space and a little bit of height. Then I would have them perform the stretch in the same way as before. First with the ankle pushing down and once they get used to that with the toe pushing down. And the reason that I would do that for ACL reconstructed patients or ACL uh, patients who are um, sus suspected of having an ACL injury is because the ACL's job is to stop the um, tibia from sliding forward on the femur and um, in those cases if I've repaired the uh, ACL I don't want to subject the new graft to um, those types of shear forces 
So I want to make sure that there is something in the way of the tibia to stop it from moving forward. And in this uh, exercise, we are using the table surface itself as a means to stop the uh, um, tibia from sliding forward. And we just want to use our firm object to provide enough space to make sure that we can elevate the quad or elevate the femur a little bit off the table just so that we can get some of that extension. So these are some of the simple uh, extension exercises that I would utilize. So we've talked about some simple extension exercises. So now what I'd like to talk about are some simple flexion exercises. So there's two exercises that I want to demonstrate for people. So the first one is what we call a supine heel slide. And this is very, very simple. So what I'll do is to get the patient uh, to lay down in a seated, or sorry, in a, a supine position. All they are going to do is under their own control, they are going to slide the heel up and then bring it as close to their buttock as possible. Okay? And then they can slide it back down. Okay? So once again, they'll slide it up as close as possible and then slide it back down okay now there are a number of ways in which we can um, uh, facilitate this and so you can do what's called an active assisted so what I first did there was I just did an active um, uh, heel slide but you could also do an active assisted heel slide which is where you take the heel up and then you assist the heel in, either with your hand or with a band or a blanket or a rope uh, to bring it in closer. And that would help to uh, do it a little bit more. Now, um, I often have patients or their therapists say to me, well, what about a passive heel slide? Which is where the therapist is the one who picks the leg up and slides it in. And although that is a valid, um, therapeutic technique to use, I generally prefer my patients to use um, the active or the active assisted approach so that they can learn to activate and um, develop the muscle uh, control patterns themselves. Okay. Also, uh, it encourages the patients uh, to work through their discomfort and their pain symptoms themselves because um, they are the ones that are causing themselves the discomfort. They know what level of discomfort they are causing themselves, and they are in control of um, ca either causing the discomfort or stopping the discomfort. So generally, patients will feel more comfortable with an active or an active assisted approach. So the first exercise is the supine heel uh, slide. Okay. The next exercise that I'll often um, ask my patients to perform is um, a four-point prone kneel to a two-point seated kneel or sitting kneel. So usually this takes a little bit of time for the patients to be comfortable putting their knee down, uh, their operative knee down on the surface. Um, however, when they do this, um, or once they are able to do this, then they can start to utilize this um, stretch. Uh, and so what they're going to do from this for this stretch is to first start it in a four-point kneeling stance like this. Then they're going to slowly come back using simply gravity in their body weight and push themselves backwards until they can sit on their heel. Now, as you can see, um, this is kind of the extent of where I can go today. Um, just having had surgery yesterday and I can't quite sit on my heel. But obviously the goal is to be able to get back to sitting on your heels. Now, there's no rush to go through this um, quickly. And as I said at the beginning, we want to hold each stretch for approximately 60 seconds. So you want to take yourself to a spot where it's uncomfortable to be there, but not so uncomfortable that you're not going to be able to hold it for 60 seconds because it's the time under tension which is most important here. So we want to make sure that we can go into a position where we put 
put some stress on our structures and stretch them out, but not so much or so far that we can't maintain that position for the, the period of time. And what I'll often tell patients to do is to find that position where it's just a little bit sore, where their eyes start to cross a little bit, and then sit there. And all you want to do is relax, take nice deep breaths and relax. And what you'll find is that as you relax, you'll be able to sink more deeply into the stretch than you were able at the start. And when we do these stretches, our goal should always be to progress the stretch a little bit each time, each and every rep. You should try to get a little bit further than you were the time before. So those are two simple stretches that we can do to restore knee flexion. So the last thing that we're going to talk about today is uh, quad activation. And so um, this is one of the things that, that often proves most difficult for patients uh, postoperatively. So I generally like to try and get as early a start on this as, as we can. So here we are, uh, postoperative day number one, and uh, I'm going to start doing some quad activation exercises. So we're gonna demonstrate two exercises today for people to work on. Um, so the first one is what uh, is called a seated, a seated isometric hold. Okay, so this is the, the easiest one to do. Uh, Having said that, it's not that it's easy, it's just that in terms of the exercise, it is the easiest. So, um, what we're going to do for this one, all we're going to do is we're going to contract the quadricep muscle and we are going to try to get the back of our knee to touch the table. Okay? So, again, you want to try to do and hold this for uh, as long as you can. For this particular hold, you don't need to do that for 60 seconds. You can certainly do it for 15 seconds, or if you're becoming more advanced, you can do it for 30 seconds. Uh, you don't need to hold it for 60, but your goal should be to fire the quadricep muscle, make the quadricep muscle as tight and as rock hard as possible, and to get both your back of your knee as close to the um, table, preferably touching the table if possible, and your heel off the table if possible, okay? And so for that, what we essentially do is I'll just sit in this fashion, I'll sit straight up, uh, straight upright, and I will just bear down with my knee as hard as I can, contracting the quadricep, touching the muscle to make sure that it is hard, putting my hand underneath to make sure that there is no space, and seeing that there is no space or sorry, there is space underneath my heel, okay? And I will know that I am actively contracting my quad if I am able to raise my heel up off the table. So somebody should be able to come, come to you as you are doing this exercise, pass their fingers underneath your heel on the table and not touch your heel, okay? So that will tell you that you're contracting your quads adequately. And so, um, this is the first uh, and easiest exercise um, for people to perform. But as I said before, although it's the easiest, it's not necessarily easy to do. One of the cues that I'll give to patients to help them to uh, focus and do this is to actually tell them to tell themselves that I am now contracting the quad and I'll get them to employ some feedback while they do that and I'll tell them to touch the quad, touch the muscle that they want to contract, and to tell themselves out loud, I am now contracting the quad. I am now contracting the VMO, this muscle right here. And by repeating that to themselves and giving themselves feedback, they're helping to re-cement the link in their brain between the muscle and their brain so that the muscle, so that the brain um, or pardon me, the muscle realizes that when the brain says quadricep contract, the, this muscle right here is the one that we're talking about and this is what we want to fire. So I'll actually get them to do. I am now contracting this muscle right here. I am contracting the VMO. I am contracting this muscle as they do it so that they can help to re-cement that connection in the brain. So that's one exercise. 
The other exercise is a variation of that same exercise. And in this one, we're going to do a prone quad isometric contraction. And so if I, if I lay here on the table in, in a prone position and I um, am not contracting any muscles, my quadriceps will be against the table, my knee will be against, the front part of my knee will be against the table, and the front part of my shin will be against the table. But I also told you that normally most people have a small amount of um, hyperextension built into their skeleton. So if I am, if you look at my non-operative leg over here, and you watch when I contract my quad, you'll see that my knee goes from being on the table to being off the table. Okay, so my knee here, here's my knee touching the table. Now here's me contracting the quad, getting that hyperextension, and now only my quadricep and my tibia touch, but my knee is off the table. So this is a, another um, exercise, which is ex exactly the same as the other side, but the goal is different. Before we were trying to get the knee off, or sorry, the knee to touch, the back of the knee to touch the table, and now we are trying to get the knee off the table. So if I turn around the other way so that you can see my operative side, as I contract my leg, my thigh and my foot are on the table, but my operative knee is off, okay? So here's no contraction, and then here's contraction. Doing it in a prone fashion, actually employs more muscles than just the quadricep. Um, so this is slightly more difficult. When we do it in a prone fashion, we start to um, engage what we call the hollow position. And that's where our core is engaged, our lower extremity, quadricep muscles, the hip flexors are engaged, and we start to round our body like a banana. So, once again, I'll be in this position, and I will contract my core, I will tilt my pelvis, contract my quadriceps, and I will essentially raise my knee off the table. I'll hold this position for a 15 second count, and then at the end, I'll relax. And I'll do that two or three times in a row, and that's a um, slightly more difficult uh, quadriceps activation uh, exercise.